I want to begin our time of study by asking those who are married, how many of you have ever been through a major argument with your spouse? Would you raise your hand? I want all the young people to look around at all of these hands. And, and that's not to frighten you, that's just to teach you the reality that conflict is the inevitable byproduct of ma being married to a sinner. So if you're married to a sinner, don't freak out if problems come into your relationship because everybody goes through them. Everybody fights. And since that's the case, the critical question before us is, how do we deal with our conflicts? Are there any biblical principles that would really help us to resolve the difficulties that presently are keeping us apart? Well, according to our passage of Scripture, the answer is an overwhelming maybe. <laughs> Let me show you where this is taught. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, open please to the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, as we continue our study of God's songs for lovers looking this morning at how we resolve marital conflict. The Song of Solomon, chapter 5. If you didn't bring your own Bible but would like to read along with us, there's an extra one right in the pew rack there in front of you, and the page number's up on the screen for those who are less familiar. Let me set the historic context. Uh, if you remember back to last weekend, we left Solomon and his new bride. She simply identified by the term the Shulamite. They're having a terrible argument about sex. Solomon had been out late at night, we're not told why, but he arrives at the bedroom door and he's locked out. So he starts knocking on the bedroom door and talking all lovey-dovey to her. Romeo is here! Well, she's not too thrilled. She's just falling asleep and she speaks back to him uh, words that essentially say, I'm not in the mood. Go away which is what Solomon does. He takes off into the night and goes to some undisclosed location. And we highlighted last weekend how their selfish responses, both of their, both of their parts, how it led to frustration and isolation. How it drove them, destroyed the intimacy between them. And we've been using this prop to help us understand God's plan. If you remember, Bob the Builder and Cinderella want to make sweet music together. To do so, they have to build their relationship on the strong spiritual foundation, supported by pillars of common values for decision-making and emotional connection that supports, then, the physical relationships, the sexual relationship in a marriage. Well, what we saw happen last week is that the common decision for uh, common uh, values for decision making took a turn for the worse. Rather than being unselfish, they became selfish and thought only of their own agenda, only what was best for them. As a result, it broke the emotional connection between them. And because of that, there was no support at all for any physical intimacy between them. And this is how we left them. Bob has left the building, <laughs> and Cinderella has gone to look for him. That's where we pick up our text, the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, and verse 8. See it with me? In emotional agony, she cries out, verse 8, I adjure or charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, as to what you will tell him, for I am lovesick. In other words, if you find him before I do, tell him as the NIV, I'm faint with love for him. I want to reconcile this relationship. I don't want to be apart. So she wants to deal with this conflict. And apparently, they do. As we come to the end of this section over in chapter 6, we see that they're reunited. Look at chapter 6 and verse 11 with me. I'm not 100% sure who is speaking these words. It's either Solomon or the Shulamite. Uh, whoever speaks them, what they communicate is clear. See chapter 6 and verse 11 with me? 
At the end of this section, I went down to the orchard of the nut trees to see the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded or the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was aware, my soul, or my desire as the NIV, set me over the chariots of my noble people. In symbolic language, Solomon is saying to his bride, or his bride to Solomon, At the end of this story, our hearts are reconnected to the point where we resume our relationship as husband, wife, as king and queen, and we reunite over the chariots of God's very anointed and chosen people. So at the end of the song, they're back together. The question is, how'd they get there? What did they do? Because the message of the song is really, really straightforward. What we're going to be emphasizing during our time together is that there's always hope for a better relationship. Things can improve. The husband and wife that you were in the past does not mean you cannot be a different husband and wife in the future. A selfish person can learn to be unselfish. Things can change. The relationship can get better. There is hope for us. And there certainly was for Solomon and the Shulamite. So how'd they get there? During our time of study, we're going to look at six key principles that help them resolve their marital conflict. These six principles can be used if there's problems in any kind of a relationship. Two friends with each other, a a, a boss and, and an employee, a teacher, students, a coach, and players, but it's especially applicable for a husband and wife. There's hope. Uh, How'd they resolve their marital conflict? Let's dig into our text now. Go back to chapter 5, and let's see the very first principle. Uh, We're going to see in response to the wife's emotional plea in verse 8, the the chorus line... Ask the question, verse 9. What kind of beloved is your beloved, O most beautiful among women? What kind of beloved is your beloved that you thus adjure us? In other words, why in the world should we help you go looking for this man who just left you high and dry? Well, she answers, verse 10. My beloved is dazzling, he's radiant, and ready. Think that he's got good color outstanding among 10,000. Well, she's really changed from chapter 5 and verse 3, go away, to now she's saying, this guy is the best of the best. So what caused her attitude to change? Well, the first principle that we're going to see, if you want to resolve a conflict, it always, always begins in dealing with the spiritual issues. In this case, there has to be repentance of sin. The text doesn't go into the details. All we know is that selfishness caused the problem, and at the end of the song, they're back together. So the strong assumption is is that Solomon went to his bride and said, listen, I'm really sorry, I was totally selfish. Please forgive me. The implication is that the Shulamite, the, the wife, said to her husband, I'm really, really sorry. I was only thinking about myself. Please forgive me. Step one in the process is always, always, always to deal with our sin. Thus, if you've been fighting at home, the question to ask is, Lord, where did I go wrong? What did I do? Was I selfish? Was I arrogant? Was I I foolish? Was I, was I proudful? Was I spiteful or vengeful? Lord, what did I do to c- contribute to this conflict? So the best thing that you can do is pray through Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any, What? hurtful way in me. Lord, would you show me? Show me what I've done. And then lead me in the everlasting way. 
It always begins with us. You say, Pastor, but what about my, my spouse's part in the argument? Well, everybody who's ever been married knows that the old saying is true. It takes two to, what? To tango. Everybody knows that. But that's not the place to start in resolving the conflict. The place to start is with your issues. And if the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin into your heart, the best thing for you to do is go and confess your sin and know that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us. The only way that resolution is going to take place is if your heart is cleansed. So let me ask you, in your last fight, what was your part in it? Have you, have you taken the first step and gone to the Lord, confessed your sin, gotten right with him so that your heart is clean? Because it has to be if you're going to make beautiful music again with your spouse. It starts with repentance. A second principle. Remember the positives. It's very, very easy in the midst of conflict to get absorbed with the pain caused by our spouse to the point where we become hyper-negative or hypercritical. And if reconciliation is going to occur, some balance in our perspective needs to be restored. And that's what we see from this Shulamite's description of Solomon. Previously, she won't even get out of bed to unlock the door. Now, notice the total change. She describes him, verse 11. His head is like gold, pure gold. Is he, is he dark or tanned? His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. So he's got this jet black wavy hair. Verse 12. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. They're mounted like jewels as the NIV. He's got these sparkling eyes. Verse 13. His cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. So he's wearing this really potent cologne that yields sweet perfume. Verse 13. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. Was he a good kisser? Verse 14. His hands or his arms are rods of gold set with burl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphire. So she's just right. He's got a six pack. <laughs> so she's definitely, she's definitely focusing on, on the positives. Verse 15. His legs are pillars of alabaster or marble set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedar. So he's the stud. He's a big, tall guy. Verse 16, his mouth is full of sweetness, and he is wholly desirable. What is she doing? She's just balancing her perspective. Sure, he's not perfect. He got a lot of good qualities, too. Noticing her finishing words about him, verse 16. This is my beloved, and this is my, what? My friend. When was the last time you considered your spouse your friend? Sounds funny just saying that, doesn't it? But some of us forget a friendship with our spouse. Some of us treat our friends better than our spouse. Who treated them as friends would certainly change our perspective and our behavior, wouldn't it? There needs to be some balance. So, if you're in the middle of a conflict, ask yourself, what's good about my spouse? Not perfect, but what are some of the good things about her or about him? Because we can become really hypercritical. I've had uh, ladies that come into my office. They said, Pastor, my husband's a total wreck. I said, okay, what's his problem? Well, there's no pizzazz in him. 
Oh, pizzazz. Yeah, it's terrible. He's boring. I said, okay, what does he do? Oh, he goes to work every day. Okay. Well, he comes home. He's good with kids, but there's no, there no pizzazz in him. So I said, okay, I got, I got a suggestion for you. I want you to go and tell your husband to quit his job. And go cash in all your IRAs and all your retirement and take you around the world, spend all the money that you have so that you end up in poverty. How's that sound to you? People tend to get it pretty quickly. Uh, in marriage, there's a lot of things that are problems. A lack of pizzazz ain't one of them. A lot of worse things. I have a, husbands come and tell me, oh, things are terrible at home. Okay, tell, tell me about your wife. She's gained a little weight. Oh, okay. I tell you what, I want you to go home, tell your wife to quit her job, and then go to gym each day. And after the gym, go to the spa, sit in the jacuzzi, and get a massage. After that, go lay by the pool. Read, sleep, rest, so that she's ready for you when you come home. Most husbands get it pretty quickly. She may not be perfect. A lot of problems in a marriage. Weight ain't one of them. What are the good things about your spouse, about your friend? If we lose sight of these things, we'll start to grow into the fantasy that there's a partner out there that will be perfect for us and make us perfectly happy and never works out like that. Remember the positives. Get some balance, won't you? If there's going to be reconciliation, there has to be repentance and remembering and a reflecting before responding. Having heard these marvelous descriptions of Solomon, the chorus of girls, they are more than willing to help find him. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Notice what they ask. Shulamite, where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Where is he? Now, we're not told how she knows, but Shulamite says, verse 2, My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the bed, beds of balsam, to pasture his flock in the gardens and gather lilies. I think in this context, it's best to take these words literally. Apparently, Solomon and Shulamite had a favorite garden that they went to. It was a pastoral setting. It was calm. There was water there. Flowers or lilies all around. Why would Solomon go there? I think it's very plausible. He went there to think, to reflect to be thoughtful. And from his example, we, re we learn that resolving conflicts are much easier when individuals have had time to think an issue through. So press the rewind button. Go back to your last fight. Did you just simply blurt out emotionally the first words that came to your mind? If you did, my guess is that you may very well have just thrown gas on the fire and made a much more intense disagreement. It's why the scriptures tell us time and again to consider our words before we speak them. The scorched earth approach to communication doesn't work. So we have to think about where are we right now? Screaming at each other down at the Westfield Mall doesn't improve the relationship. Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. There's the right place to argue. There's a right time to argue. 
My dear wife, Marcia, and I, we've learned that exhausted people don't argue well. Uh, we know Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And we tried to practice that when we were first married. Neither of us are night people. And we were up at 2 o'clock in the morning and nothing was working. It was just making matters worse. We finally decided we're going to bed, albeit on separate sides, but we're going to bed. And when we get up in the morning with a little bit of sleep, we'll be able to tackle this problem again. There's a right time, a right place to argue. And it's especially true if your spouse isn't listening, if your spouse is ill, if your spouse is impaired in some way, either with alcohol, with narcotics, especially if there's some impairment with anger so that the words are not going to be received or spoken in a rational way. Beloved, there is a time to walk away from an argument. If you're in any way tempted to raise your hand, to grab, to shake, to push, to strong arm another person, it's time to get out of there and to wait to a much more appropriate time when rational response can be made. So the scriptures talk about it time and again. Reflect before you respond. And suffice to say, turning up the volume of your arguing won't help your spouse hear your point any better. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word, what does it do? Uh, uh, loose translation, just ticks your spouse off even more. So how would you describe your pattern of communication when you're arguing? Are you a screamer or a yeller? The scriptures say reflect, think about it. Rather than reacting, consider your response. It's the way to reconcile. Certainly was true with Solomon and the Shulamite. He's down in the garden now. He's thinking this through. And she's confident that they can work all of their troubles out. Verse 3, see why? She says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. The fourth principle. If you're going to resolve a conflict, reaffirm your commitment to the relationship. She knows they are connected. I am my beloved's. I belong to him, and he belongs to me. She understands it. This relationship is based upon a, a permanent commitment to each other through the good times and through the bad. And I, I love this verse. I've always loved this verse. I, I have it etched in my wedding ring because it's the basis for my relationship with my dear Marcia through the ups and downs of life. It's my way of saying to her, you're stuck with me. Here's the point, trust is built on the foundation of security. If your spouse knows and feels a sense of permanent commitment to the relationship, he or she will be much more likely to trust and listen to the words you speak. But if your spouse is afraid that the next argument will lead to separation or even the possibility of a dissolution of the marriage, there's no trust and no basis for honesty and transparency. In other words, there's going to be no resolving if you're ready to bail. So, have you reaffirmed your commitment to your spouse lately? It's especially a good challenge for those of us who have been married for a while. When was the last time that you said, 
I take you for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. If it's been a while, I'm going to give you that opportunity at the end of our time of study here. I'm not going to ask you to do anything publicly. It's between you and your spouse and the Lord. But it really, really helps to resolve a conflict when there is a commitment made. And that's why some of you husbands, when you go home, are going to need to say to your wife, listen, I'm committed to you, but we've got some stuff we have to talk about. And a wife, you know that I love you. We're in this together, you and me against the world, but we have some things that we have to address. Changes everything. And Solomon and the Shulamite, they're just modeling this for us. So the wife goes down to this garden. She finds Solomon there. Notice carefully what he says to her when she arrives, verse 4. The husband said to, says to his wife, you are as beautiful as Terza. My, my darling, Terza was a beautiful ancient city. As lovely as Jerusalem. As awesome as an army with banners. So he immediately affirms the beauty of her, of her body, but notice that he, he doesn't get distracted or pretend like there isn't a problem. Verse 5, he says to her, turn your eyes away from me, for they have confused me. They've overwhelmed me as the NIV. In other words, he looks at her and at her beauty, and he starts thinking about her sexually. And he says, I can't go there because we have something else that we have to talk about. So turn your eyes away from me. And that response gives us the fifth principle. Problems have to be confronted. It would have been very, very easy for Solomon just to pretend like nothing happened between them. He had a beautiful wife, wanted to be with him. But he knew that there was something wrong, so please don't look at me like that. We have to talk about something. The lesson is straightforward. You cannot ignore problems away. You got a splinter in your hand, you got to take it out. You have an infection in your blood, you got to deal with it. You have a problem in your relationship, pretending like it's not there won't help. And thus, if there's anger, you have to address it. If alcohol is a problem, it has to be confronted. Selfishness, sexual addiction, pornography, overspending, a third person has entered in, emotional flirting, uh, Facebook connections. Is there a problem that needs to be addressed? And this is where I, f I feel badly because in a lot of cases, only one of the spouses wants to deal with the problem. And that's why the answer is an overwhelming maybe. You can do everything right in a relationship, but if your spouse does not want to deal with it, there's really not, not that much that you can do. And that is heartbreaking. 
It takes two to tango. It takes two to resolve a conflict. And this is why some of our couples are, are driven to such drastic measures as separating for the purpose of reconciliation. The problem is so intense and the spouse refuses to deal with it that an extreme action is called upon in order to address the problem, to force the issue. Those are extreme cases. More often than not, there's an issue that we just don't want to talk about. But we need to. We've got to lean into the pain. And you say, Pastor, why should, I, why should I go through all of this? The answer is simple. Because the relationship is worth it. It's your marriage. The best picture that we have of the triunity of Almighty God is marriage. God the Father and relationship with God the Son and relationship with God the Holy Spirit. A triunity. Best pictured as God in relationship with a husband in relationship with his wife. A triunity. And that's why marriage is under such severe attack. If the devil wants to destroy anything, he wants to destroy the image of God. And that's why we have to fight so hard to resolve our conflicts. And so the king in the song, he starts to describe his wife, verse 5. We've seen this before. This is the goat stuff. Verse 5, your hair is like a flock of goats that is descended from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes or sheep which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not, not one among them has lost her young. Your temples are like a slice of a, of a pomegranate behind your veil. This is almost identical to the description back in chapter 4. But interestingly, there's no mention of her lips no mention of her tongue, no mention of her breasts. Solomon wants to stay on subject. He do not want, want to pretend like they don't have a problem. It was too important to him, this relationship. Verse 8, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and maidens without number, but my dove, my perfect one, is unique. What was he saying? You're worth the effort. You're worth the struggle. You're worth the confrontation. Your husband may be far from perfect, but he's still your husband. Your wife may be far from perfect, but she's still your wife. So don't run away. Because what's really needed is repairing the brokenness. And that's what Solomon and the Shulamite experience. They get to the end. They've gone through the repentance and the remembering, the reflection, restoring, confront the problem. I'm sorry, please forgive me. And they repair what was broken. What I did was really self centered. I'm sorry. I don't want to be selfish. Forgive me. Forgiveness is extended. The emotional connection returns. Now there's some support and basis. And Cinderella and Bob the Builder can make beautiful music together again. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? You can have a better marriage relationship if you do it God's way. 
The problem is you're married to a sinner. And so if you repair the brokenness today, guess what? Two days from now, it might break and fall apart again. We're not perfect people. Never have been, never will be. So what's the key? What's the key? You gotta keep working at it. You've got to keep working at it. In spite of our brokenness, God has the power to speak and God has the power to heal. And God is the one who can make the difference. But you have to stay committed. If you need some help, we have counselors and pastors who can help ministries here designed to help marriages that are good and marriages that are in trouble. We'll try our best to help. And after the service, there'll be pastors and elders down here if you have an immediate need. We can pray for you. But don't leave this place without doing business with God and reaffirming your commitment to him, to your spouse. Hope you will. We thank you, our Father that you promise that you're close to the brokenhearted. And I pray that you would speak powerfully your word of healing into that spouse who has refused to face her or his problems, please. Strengthen the spouses who are seeking you. We pray for our young married couples that they would endure. For the middle-aged, for those of us who have been married for decades, that you would continue to breathe your grace that I and we might be Godly spouses, help me, Lord. Protect us from the evil man and evil woman, but give us the courage and the faith to believe and trust you and to do it your way. So if it's in your heart, reaffirm your commitment to your spouse, won't you? For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer in sickness and in health. Till death do us part. Thank you for your mercy and grace for my and our past failures, for the hope of today and tomorrow. Hear the prayers of your people for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.